So I, 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 I've written a big profile of you guys and, and what you did at, uh, at, at beginnings of Instagram. I talk about your relationship. I want to start talking about your relationship because you have stayed together. A lot of founders separate. There's all it's like bands. I guess rock bands. Um, you're not exactly the Rolling Stones yet. But what? Um, where? How do you look at your relationship now when you're inside of a big company like Facebook? What, how do, what's your interaction like now in jobs? I think the thing I say that the reason it's worked is that neither of us want each other's jobs. I think that's like a, a good pattern for success in co-founders. <laughs> um, pretty early on, there came a point where. We'd launched, before launching, we were basically doing the same thing, which is building the product, coding all the time. Like, there's still a bunch of code in there that Kevin wrote. Um, and once we launched, there was this dual competing pressure of we have to scale the site and keep it up, but we also need to start talking to investors and start having outside meetings. And that was like a natural split point where Kevin's engineering ramped up, mine kind of ramped down, mine ramped up. And it's kind of like been the relationship since then, but it's worked well. And I think like having the amount of context we do with each other after working together for five, almost five years now, uh, it's nice because it means that not every decision needs to be both of us. It can be like, oh yeah, I, I can channel Kevin and I think Kevin can channel me pretty well at this and point too. Mike will never give himself credit for this, but he's one of the nicest guys I've ever met. Mm -hmm. um, we actually have a, like a value internally of just like as much humility as we possibly can because mm -hmm. we realize that no matter how big we were or are, like the challenge is always ahead of us. Mm -hmm. And I think like we've never really let it get to our heads internally because we're always super paranoid about us not executing, about us not being able to like get to the next chapter. Mm -hmm. So I think that just kept us humble and like focused on work, that and the split. So humility in Silicon Valley. Excuse Trying me if to. I don't believe you completely, but go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, listen, it's not a common trait, but I think if you talk to people internally, like we really focus on making sure that we know that we have many chapters ahead and that we're like 1% 1 done. Mm -hmm. um, we have over 200 million users using the service, but even that you know, pales in comparison to something like Facebook, right? Mm -hmm. So we have a big opportunity ahead of us, and no matter how many successes we've had along the way, it's always challenging, and I think it's just important to keep your head about you. Speaking of Facebook, are you um, now, a couple years later, looking back, do you wish you'd held out a little longer? I mean, given the, the way deals and independence have gone for later acquisitions of Facebook since then and just in general. Um, do you think that, do you owe your success to being part of Facebook or could you have done it just fine on your own? I think it's a really fair question, but at the same time, like true entrepreneurs measure their success in terms of like impact in the world. And I think the way I would answer like, if, if I were to say, yes, I regret it, it would be because we're not successful because we don't have as many users as we would have otherwise, but neither of those are true. In fact, we have over 200 million people using it, 170 employees that are really happy. What were the um, numbers when you joined? Like less than 30, and we had six engineers, so it was pretty, it was tough going. It's, from the outside, I think we had already gotten a fair amount of success and traction, but I mean, now it's bigger, but um, what wasn't visible was the problems that we were about to hit were problems that actually aligned really well with what worked once we got in there. So spam was becoming a problem, and week one of us getting down there, I called, uh, or I called, I walked over to the building, right, to the, to the site integrity team, which does spam fighting. I was like, help, like, what have you guys learned over four years of fighting, like, spam better, better than anybody else, basically, out there? Um, things like recruiting, where we had six engineers after two years and 30 million-ish users is criminal, right? Like, it was like <laughs> not a sustainably long time. It's actually problematic, because we've become this example of how to do it, and actually would do I think we should have been at least twice that size on the engineering team. Mm -hmm. And I hear from other engineers like, yeah, my boss is like, Instagram could do it with six people, why can't you do it too? I'm like, no, that's actually not the lesson to be learned from here. Um, but we'd gotten ourselves in a state where we were really busy, too busy to recruit and too busy not to, and that was, a, it helped break out of that cycle pretty quickly. We got to, we were 29 engineers by December, so in three months we'd quadrupled. So many, action, so many acquisitions fail that like, I like take a lot of pride in the work that Mike and, and his engineering team have done and like the rest of the team just making Instagram get to where it is and the impact that it has every day. Um, that's how we judge the success of Instagram. And how do you, wh why are you staying there? What, what keeps you, because a lot of these, these, when these acquisitions happen, people, the assumption is people leave pretty relatively quickly the minute they, they get vested or whatever. You seem, and I've called you a number of times, like Kevin, I've heard you're looking here and there, um, which you... It's not true. It's not true. Well, I, that's why I Trust called. Trust me, my it. boss I, then asked me, why is Kara calling? Right, I understand that. But like, it's called reporting, and you actually yeah, have no, the person. It's um, very helpful. It's crazy. Um, but, but, but you aren't leaving, and there, it doesn't charge you, but I do have to check. 
Um, so people have the assumption that one or both of you will go. What, what keeps you at a bigger company, and how do these bigger companies are going to buy up a lot of these smaller companies in the next year or so? I think most people agree. How do you keep? How do, what's kept you there besides the the delicious food and the lovely sushi? What what, what else has kept you there? But the sushi place just closed it down. Closed oh, yeah. <laughs> oh my god! Um, news, we're replacing news. it with a different Rico team. Sushi. Get on it. <laughs> um, I think it's the difference, like. Mark says it best, uh, if you're a mission-driven founder, like Mark likes to say, if you took him away from Facebook and you dropped him in the middle of the desert, like what would he work on? He'd like- he'd Speak Chinese, but go ahead. Yeah, he'd speak Chinese, <laughs> but he'd like work on making the world more open and connected. And like, I, well, that I really- I think he'd want to survive, but okay. <laughs> no, actually he would like just start walking around <laughs> working on that, I guarantee you. All and right, the okay. thing about, um, the way he talks about that really struck home with me because mm -hmm. a lot of Silicon Valley is about business and money and flipping companies. But like, I wake up in the morning and go to Instagram because like we touch so many people all around the world and the stories that come out of um, like the Insta meets that we have where our community members get together and share their stories with each other. It's like pretty amazing that four years ago this company didn't exist. And that today, every day we go into work, we get to touch hundreds of millions of people with the work that we do in a small room with now 170 employees. That's what keeps me going. Yeah, I think from a personal level, it's the job today is very, very different than what it was a year ago or two years ago. Like we were building the product, we were trying to scale the site. It's like non, you know, interacting with people problems, you know, and now it's like we have an engineering team. I run an engineering team of 70 people and that's hard, right? How do you get them all on the same page? How do you make sure you're still recruiting the right people? It's a very different role, um, but one that I actually enjoy, and I think Kevin has a very different role today, like managing a business, so like within the context of Facebook, but also with external uh, things. Like we're not raising money, but we are, we still have like internal capital, right, mm -hmm. that we need to be managing, so. You have to make money in other words. And we have to yeah. So, no, what, well, one thing that hasn't changed though is uh, the Instagram product, really, right? I mean, this, this kind of feed of pictures is very similar than it started, and it was good, you figured out a good formula that continues to work. And it seems like you've added a bunch of these um, features that are maybe auxiliary to that experience, but I don't know, it, has any of them really kind of become core? Like you have videos and hyperlapse and messaging and stuff like that, but it seems like Instagram is mostly a place where you go look at photos. It's an interesting, uh, we had a conversation with one of my engineers, actually it was our first engineering hire, and he'd had an experience over the weekend where somebody was like, oh, Instagram hasn't changed very much. And he's like, well, like there's video now, and there's direct, and then you can tag people. And, like The product has actually evolved significantly. If you had to install an old version, I think you'd be like, oh, like <laughs> it looks awful, and it's missing all these things. So I like the way that we've evolved the core product, which is not to shift a lot of things out from under people, but just make things much better. So a good example, the Explore tab, which is the second one um, in the app. Like a year ago, neither Kevin and I probably used that one at all. There was like, it was not personalized, it was pretty weak sauce, it's a technical term, and we um, decided to just revamp it and start to personalize it, and people interact with that five times more than they used to now because the content is actually good and relevant. For me, it's full of dogs, probably. Dogs. Full of dogs. Yeah. So, but uh, it's, it, that's a good example of, we actually, the stated goal of that project in the beginning of the year was not to change the UI at all, because it can be very like confusing to be, well, okay, now we've been working on the UI for six months. Did, was it better because we changed the algorithm or the UI? We're like, no, let's just focus on the algorithm and see if it can move Is the needle. Is it an algorithm of object recognition for dogs? <laughs> it's basically a dog dog. No, tracker. I mean, the thing yeah. we realized was like, the Explore page initially was meant for discovery of new accounts. So when you sign up for Instagram in the first year of using Instagram, none of your friends used it. So you had to find other accounts to follow. That was the whole point of the Explore tab. But the algorithm really didn't change for two, three years. And what happened is- It's kind of our, more of a popular page, right? Yeah, and our user base obviously did grow and became very different. Um, and it ended up being representative of, I think, like the median voter, if you will. It's like Justin Bieber picks, you know, cats, cake, right? Um, and we've all seen that's it, and that's why that I hear grouping? chuckles. Justin Bieber picks cats. That's basically the algorithm, okay. yeah. Um, so when we changed it, it became much more personalized. It became more personalized in the way that like, we look at your network and what they're liking and, and try to hone in on what you engage most with. And that, like you said, just a simple change like that ended up increasing engagement quite a bit. But to your original question about products, I mean, the way we think about this is like, 
Instagram needs to evolve and change over time, but like the fundamental aspect of storytelling, the fundamental aspect of remembering and memories stored in pixel format and communicated out to your followers, that's not gonna change. But things over time, like new creative tools, that's going to change. New formats, video, that's going to change. Different audiences with Instagram Direct, that's going to change. And like sizable portions of our user base interact with it, that every month. You know, we announced that it was about 45 million uh, monthly actives using Instagram Direct, which at the time I think was like a quarter to a third, you know, of, of the user base, and it's continued to grow very quickly. I find that product so awkward because sometimes you just want to message something and you have to take a photo of something in order to send a message, right? Yeah, I've got, it's funny, we were actually <laughs> talking about this yesterday, like the two use cases for Instagram Direct I get are like, one is group sharing, so like my parents will send me a photo and share it with our entire family, and it's a really fun experience because you get to like, you know, have that private moment in that space, but then sometimes people like take a picture of their feet and then write you a message. So, but we always follow our users, right? So like if people are using your product in a specific way, this is how we discovered Instagram. We had bourbon and people were posting all sorts of stuff, but they really loved posting square filtered photos. So we followed that and we understood that that was going to be an talk, opportunity. Talk about following that. You're watching other competitors. Uh, there's, you have less, t today, yesterday Twitter did their uh, earnings. Growth is down. It has a lot to do with the product, uh, evolving product and stuff. And they talked about a lot of people feel that it hasn't evolved enough. You're within the cocoon of Facebook, so you're a little, you're more protected than a, a Twitter. But you've got all these competitors all of a sudden emerging, all with a photo, a visual storytelling kind of in a mobile environment. When you look at a, that's just like Snapchat, you would consider a competitor or not? Would you well, look at it as that or not? I think inherent to your question is the assumption um, that a competitor has to do what you're doing to be a competitor. Right, so, no, I don't think they do. And right, so in fact, like the way we look at it, and I think a big step change for us was when we started focusing on time spent. Like how much time do people spend on Instagram Every single in the day. mobile environment, right? Yeah, exactly. Because like you're trading off of the New York Times, you're trading off of Twitter, you're trading off of Snapchat, and like whatever other apps you're using. So how much time do you spend engaging with Instagram? And like we look at that as the metric. And any anything else that competes with that time metric is a competitor. So, so the New York Times would be comparable to Snapchat then. Um, it depends who you are, I guess. Like, some people are in a photo-taking mood, and so they have the choice between them. So it's right. not a, a New York Times or... Yes, Instagram. and then there's the use case uh, competition. But like, let's actually, let's focus more on the category. So we believe that visual communication is a new category, a new way of communicating. Like the thing that happened a handful of years ago was that all of a sudden our phones had cameras. And we actually like to flip that and say all of a sudden our camera got a network. Mm -hmm. And the second your camera has a network, you're able to share that photo with anyone anywhere in the world instantly. So Drew Kelly, one of our users, is able to go into North Korea and take pictures of North Korean life and share them around the world. This one user, 1951, is in South Sudan in a refugee camp who's able to document life there, share it with the world. I mean, Do you in think of your, your users as reporters then? Um, I, I, I think reporter would be a journalist? strong, yeah. It could be citizen journalism, but I think that's a little too formal. I guess my point here is that like, we, we have place. hundreds of millions of people documenting the world in real time, and never before has that happened. And it's recorded, and it's shared, and it's distributed on other networks. So yes, in some ways, it's citizen journalism. But I think if you ask these people, all they're doing is documenting their lives. OK, but how do I find that? Like, I have this, you, this user you mentioned. On Twitter, like, it's I, the same I, issue. Yeah, I, have, I mean, that's great that you have someone there. I had no idea. The only way I would see that is if some news organization embedded their photo, right? Yeah, we have a whole team working on that now. Because it's like, it's. I agree. There's a lot of ways in which discovery is so not working. Where, do, so where right. does this evolve? Where does the product evolve? Because again, people People, people have the attention span of gnats right now, and they want something else. And I think there's a lot of something else, something else, and they get, how do you keep people from getting tired of the Instagram experience? And what we find is when people are following the right accounts and like get into the system, like they stay, which is really great. Over years, it's been four, maybe launched over four years ago, we just had our birthday. Um, and so it's less about getting tired or, or changing or evolving, but I think it's what's interesting is continue to make sure that the right content is on there, that you're connecting to the right content, that there's formats like video that keep it interesting or let you tell a different slice of the story that you were already telling, right? It's like a substantially different set of moments that you can share through those things. Um, but it's really, looking back now, 
I mean, it's funny because my first photos were awful and I had like a 3G, which had like a bad camera, but I love going back and being like, oh wow, like that was what I was doing. That's, we were in Dogpatch Labs, like building Instagram V1 or a year later, you know, we were moving into our first office and like it's a lifetime of memories. Is there something you feel like you've seen that you have to do or do you worry about reacting? Like I think about that all the time on Rico. Like I'm not doing the balance. listicles, but I kind of want to, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah. No, it's, it's always a balance of being proactive and being reactive because you're not always going to be able to predict movements, right? Like, for instance, um, hashtags were reactionary because we saw people using them on Instagram. And when we first launched Instagram, we didn't support hashtags. Now, today, Instagram without hashtags, that's like unknowable, right? So we had to do that. At the same time, there are proactive things. Like, for instance, Mike alluded to the fact of discovery or, or the idea of discovery of accounts. It's a big team right now, and we're trying to figure out how to turn that explore page into something that would allow you to actually explore not only photos and media, but hashtags as well, and people. And your question, I think, underlies the next challenge for us for the next year, which is how do you allow people to discover the content relevant to them? Because right. in the evolution of Instagram, we found some things really matter and some things don't. The stuff that doesn't matter as much is like, do we have the best filters in the world? Like, yes, it's important and it's part of our DNA and we'll never stop working on it, but like, it turns out following the right accounts, making the network strong, that's what really, really matters to the long-term health of our business. So then does it turn into kind of a Facebook news feed where you're making decisions about what I want to follow? I mean, in some ways, that might be nice because I'm following people that I've been following for four years and maybe I should give up. You know, their photos are really boring. But in other ways, uh, that's kind of leaving what you, what you guys are. It's actually what I love about Explore is that there's accounts that I have low amounts of commitment to. Like I want to see maybe one of every 10 of their photos and they get surfaced already in Explore. It's like, oh, yeah, oh, this so is that's like, the unfollow? Yeah, that's okay. the like, oh, it's, it's still around and it'll show up there. But it doesn't mean making as much of a commitment to have every single photo in your feed. Because there's something very nice and simple about having the chronological feed that we've. Let's talk about the business. Yeah. How much money do you make? Revenue speaking. <laughs> That's a secret, Karen. I understand that, but I want you to tell us. Yeah, unfortunately, we can't talk Sometimes about Sometimes this right works now. on stage. Yeah. It's, like, it's <laughs> like I feel like I'm in that Tom Cruise movie, and then you suddenly say you're guilty. And no, you the the magnet. Just Kara, the one thing I learned from you is you have to ask. <laughs> yes, I get it. Exactly. Yes. Um, so, how much money no, do you make? No, let's actually talk about the business in general. No, no, let's start. Started. Okay, all right. We can talk about that, but. <laughs> well, I'm not going to tell you how much okay, we make. All right, so. all right. You so, can keep asking. Um, no, so. How are you going to make money? Yeah, so that's. That's a great question. Okay. So uh, <laughs> we got one. Have you answered it? We got it? one. You, um, we, we can we can go to lunch and they'll just do the interview. Right. Right. So uh, so we started off about a year and a half ago with the idea that taking a platform whose natural medium is a square photo that is typically very beautiful and creative, taking a creative community of people and taking advertisers and saying, hey, you already use the service to reach your biggest fans. Don't you want to reach more of your biggest fans? The answer was yes, and that was the test. As soon as we started working with brands like Levi's, Michael Kors, Chobani, Taco Bell, mm -hmm. right? All of these brands have been using Instagram to connect with their fans since the beginning. And it was natural, it was a natural progression for them to start you know, paying for more distribution. And we worked really closely. In fact, I still to this day see every ad before it goes on to Instagram. Wow. And that's to make sure that the advertiser quality and the content quality is high enough. And, and yes, that's subjective, right? But like at the same time, the reason why is we wanted to make sure that um, advertisers were putting content into the network that would feel native to the network and mm -hmm. feel like a native experience. How many people are doing the business side of it, not right now? Well, I actually, I wish I could tell you, I honestly, we're changing numbers so quickly and hiring so many people, and it depends if you count like the people who touch it on the Facebook sales side. But on the team, there are you know, double digit number of people um, who are working on this. And we have a head of monetization, a head of market operations. We have people who go and spend time with brands, training them how to uh, basically interact on the platform. Like when people comment at you and ask questions, what, what are the terms of engagement, right? What type of content really works? Did you see the Mercedes-Benz uh, ads that were recently run? No, I didn't. About their new SUV? Mm -hmm. It was really interesting. They basically combined a meme on Instagram, which is things organized neatly, if you've seen this, where people take pictures of objects organized neatly from the top down. Mm -hmm. And they got these really famous Instagram photographers who um, have mass followings to come on and arrange what they would bring on a trip on the back mat of this SUV. It was this really beautiful combination of both a brand Essentially experience. Essentially anal retentive 
ad campaign. Uh, that, that's your word. Um, <laughs> but I, what, the way I see it is a combination of our community mm -hmm. and businesses that want to reach their consumers right. in a really beautiful way. And we're really trying to hard really trying hard to make a business out of high quality is it content. Like the Vine stars trying to get them, is that, is that the similar kind of strategy around that? Is that well, we have these people who are popular, we've got these marketers, combine them together. I, I think that's one way of looking at it. The other way of looking at it is that brands want to respect the platform and like whatever they do on the platform, they want to make sure it fits. So if they simply just take an ad off their website or they would put anywhere else, screenshot it, put it in a square format, pick a filter, throw it out, they're gonna get a bad response from people. But instead what Mercedes-Benz did was they really, they went out and proactively partnered with these folks to make really Instagram-y like content. And I think that's how we're making money is by making sure not to you know, trade off on our values, but also make sure to provide an opportunity for business and solve their problem, which is reaching consumers. But one thing that you do that's different than I think just about anywhere else is you let those consumers comment on the ads. And I was looking last night, I don't know, you get about one ad a day, is that right, on, in your feed? Uh, it depends who you are. But Okay, well, you don't think I'm a very valuable customer, so I get about one ad a day. Yeah. And, but it was, yeah, for- We're starting off slow. But it was a, like a fashion campaign, and all the comments were like, oh, that model's too skinny, she should eat a hamburger, right? Which is not like your normal, uh, I mean, that's not an offensive, spammy thing to say, but it was not pro-brand. Uh, so. Why do you allow comments to the brands actually like that? Do they take the feedback? Do they go in and delete the ones they don't like? We just had, I just had the one on American Dad ran a campaign and people were just making American Dad and Family Guy jokes in the comments as well. It's just like a nice like moment of them reacting. I think I'm happy that they're there. I think that it allows people to ask questions sometimes like, oh, where do I get that? Or at mention other people, which is kind of like our way of sending photos to each other right now is a way again, f hacking the right. platform. It's at, you know, Liz, like, hey, look at this. Maybe this model's too skinny, right, Liz? This dress is amazing, right, Liz? Like, check out the new American Dad episode. Um, yeah, maybe but the enables that you guys should build as a way to so. share things. So what we see is like Michael Kors was one of our first advertisers, and you know, I, I felt very strongly that we needed to allow people to comment because of this use case. And what you ended up seeing, what it was targeted at women, so you saw lots of women CCing their friends which is like a great way of passing around content and bringing attention to something that you're excited about. Um, it's also just like, it allows us to gather feedback. I mean, the, the one thing that we always want is feedback from our community. One of our internal values is community first. What that basically means is like, we optimize for the people that use our service before we optimize for ourselves, always. And in this case, we're community first and allowing people to comment and tell us what they think about the ads. So talk about the, the video element of it. Uh, I know Vines have taken off like crazy. About advertising or about? Both advertising and usage. Because that would seem to be uh, more money is in video. Everybody, perhaps, not for you. But many people feel that video is a, the real opportunity. Uh, Vines have been wildly popular. I know my kids watch them incessantly. Um, how do you look at that area? Is that important or is it more the photo part of your yeah. business? Well, let's split the two apart and say that um, if you're in advertising and you are a modern advertising platform, I think it's hard to be a modern advertising platform without both of them eventually, right? But the reason why we focused on photos first, and we've done some tests with video with advertisers over time, which people have seen, um, but we focused on photos because that was like truly native to the platform. If you look at most people's camera rolls, I mean, most of your camera roll, I'm assuming, are photos, and then somewhere around 5%, maybe you take videos. And that's true on our platform as well as, as what people share. So on the consumer side, we've started you know, work and, and we've actually launched many improvements to video. It starts more quickly, um, it uploads more quickly, you don't have to go through so many steps to post, we've simplified the product, and we will continue to evolve the consumer side. On the advertising side, I think like, you know, we're just asking the community and asking advertisers what products they want and how they want to interact with the community and what feels right, and we're learning over time. So I think it's important in the long run, but I, I mean, it's all about doing the right thing at the right time so with the photos community. photos is where your real focus is for your business. It is currently. It is currently. Um, last question, and then we'll get to quick questions. Uh, devices. I just got the giant iPhone 6, which I- Six plus or six? Plus, six I plus. saw it. That yeah. is giant. Huge. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I had to return mine. I'm a big really? guy, and that was even too big. Yeah. It's like the size I of the I got the six head. instead, which I love. Really? Yeah. I can handle big. Um, so um, I know that's unusual coming from me, but it's true. Um, 
I have lots of iPhone sex jokes, which I'm not going to make right here. Um, but the, um, when you think about these devices, it does change the experience. I tell you, I consume a lot more photos. I consume a lot more content. How do you, how, where do you look at what's happening next? Where does this go in, in the visuals, in the mobile visual storytelling? Because you're, you're merging uh, tablets with, I, with phones and stuff like that. How do you look at that, where it's coming next? It's, I think the biggest theme is that there's no longer one size fits all. So uh, in many cases, the screens are getting bigger faster than the networks are getting faster or more quickly than the, net, the, net, the networks are evolving. So people are like, I want like bigger photos all the time. And you're like, do you really want them? Because you're gonna spend a lot of time waiting for them if you're on like a 3G connection back in Brazil where I'm from. Like I worry about people getting iPhone 6s in Brazil and just like having a slower experience overall. So one of the projects we're taking on right now is just having a better story across the board. Like for the Samsung Galaxy Ace, which is tiny, it's 320, it's like a quarter to a sixth of the resolution of the iPhone 6. How do we make sure those people get just the bits that they need and as fast as possible. Whoops, speaking uh -oh. of phones. Uh, and then on the other end of the, the cracked, extreme, guys, it's okay. <laughs> it's great. And on the other uh, end of the spectrum for the six plus, like maybe when, our, when you're on Wi-Fi, we give you a really great experience there. We start doing different things and is that where resolution. your growth is coming from now? I mean, now that you're at a hundred, hundreds of millions of users, you must be kind of looking to places that are not, you know, people in this audience. Um, so is that is, is your growth coming now from more emerging markets, less, you know? First time phone owners, kind of things like yeah, that. Yeah, we grow a lot internationally. I mean, including yeah. teenagers, right? You're very big with teenagers. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting to see. You know, we've actually done a couple of times, we've been send researchers to different countries and say, like, use Instagram there and interview local folks about what's actually hard and what's working and come what have back we and report. Well, it's slow, and there's like opportunities to make things. Yeah, photos better. are kind of hard to well, everything shrink slow. down. Yeah, 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 everything is very, very slow, and and that's a that's an opportunity. The other part is, you know, we design and we test on these high-end phones, but it's actually really important for apps to work well on devices that are actually more typical of these countries. So our Android team, especially, has spent a ton of work just saying, all right, how can we make our app the absolute fastest to start, to scroll, to download, just all performance across the board. And if you're on a really nice phone, it's already fast enough, so maybe you don't notice it. But if you're on a Galaxy Ace, and you're like, wow, like this is actually something I enjoy. Do you have a phone on Facebook, cam or a room on Facebook campus with no connectivity so you can test bad? There's actually a Wi-Fi network you can join that will simulate what it's like to be on d in different countries. So you can say, I want to feel like what it's like to be in Brazil, and then actually, I left. I left it on by mistake, and I wrote to IT. I'm like, the Wi-Fi is really slow, and they're like, are you sure you didn't enable the like slow network? Brazil mode. <laughs> yeah, that's what I had. Brazil mode. So, last very quick question: When you oh, look around know. the landscape, and we'll get to questions. Yeah. What is just very quickly one answer? What do you think is the coolest thing you've seen recently? Not Instagram, and you can't answer Instagram. Something like very quickly. Oh man, I've started using Quip a lot for collaboration and spreadsheets, and we use it like for Instagram. We basically run a lot of our process through it now, and it's just like spreadsheets that are actually good on mobile, which is, I thought, an unsolvable problem a year ago. Uh, when I worked on Google Health back, back, way back in the day, six years ago, I met this small little company named Fitbit, mm -hmm. and I was so excited about what they were doing, and we kind of lost touch, but just recently, I've been buying all the Fitbit devices, and I'm realizing like the huge potential for collecting personal health information and what that will do for personal analytics. That's what I'm most excited about. Okay, questions from the audience? Hi, Nancy Casey from Valhalla Capital. I just texted my 19-year-old daughter while we were sitting here. She's studying engineering, and I asked her, Instagram, what do you think? She said, Mom, it's just a picture editing app. It doesn't do anything else. None of my friends use it anymore. Do you have any comment? Ooh, she's much meaner than I am. <laughs> she also Sarah, wasn't did you pay her? Yes, I did. <laughs> she also wasn't surprised that you didn't talk about revenue. And she said, I hope Vines and Tumblr are making a lot of revenue because I'm wasting my life on those. Got it, yeah. Vines particularly are fascinating among young people. It's really, they're inane, but my kids love them, I gotta say. Yeah, well, I, I mean, obviously, like, I hope that we can continue to, um, you know, be a platform for people like your daughter. Um, our data shows that we're growing very quickly, you know, everywhere you um, in all demographics. Tonight? Will you report that tonight when Rep Facebook reports? Uh, we, no, uh, that's, that's, I mean, Facebook has a separate uh, process and we we'll did talk show, about it. I mean, not that Kevin needs any help defending himself, but last night those slides we showed at dinner of interesting stats. If you looked at US teens, by far the service they use the most is Instagram. But I do think it, the, the point is they do get tired of these things and they move on, like a lot That's of a good things point. that they do. Yeah, today, for today. For today, which is interesting. And the question is how do you keep Instagram from being a must-have yeah. 
app that you use all the time to something that they move on from. I mean, this yeah. is the same issue that Snapchat's going to face. They're yeah, all. and I've never asked, I mean, what's interesting for us, uh, I'm 30, you're 28. Yeah. So you're uh, super old now. S well, compared to a lot of the people that, that are the tastemakers for apps, yes. Yeah. And what's important is, we talked about humility before, is to have the humility that we are not necessarily our consumers. So we have you know, entire teams dedicated to understanding international users, younger users. Part of our community team exists to be able to communicate effectively with teens. Like, what are the stars they're paying attention to? What events do they watch? Like, what are the trends? And we make sure to be relevant to them, both in the features we build and the editorial we put out. So like, we're concentrating on it. And I think like what you're uh, highlighting is an important part of our strategy, which is we need to make sure to stay relevant to all cohorts as we become this massive service. So it's really important, and thank you it for is, asking. It is interesting. Thank you. I mean, I, I, just to be fair, my son still loves Instagram, but mostly because he wants to meet girls now. So go ahead. Hey, John Mullenholz from Outbrain. So how do you think about scaling your advertisements? So, you know, you personally checking every ad that goes on Instagram is one thing, um, but even more so getting brands to do that hard work of, you know, understanding the platform and creating content that makes sense for Instagram. How does that scale? Yeah, um, two very quick things on that. One is uh, the team thinks it, it doesn't scale, but I've proved them wrong by checking every advertisement still. Um, and they've been surprised, my commitment, and I think it's really important to the platform that we continue to watch everything as it goes on. Um, number two is there's something called social proof, okay? The reason why a lot of you guys are wearing jackets today is because the, when you show up, the last time you came to a conference, people were wearing jackets. If you start advertising high quality, you set the bar very high, all the other advertisers look around at you know, what's gone on on the platform and they say, we should be doing that. So that's the way you make it scale. And what we're doing is simply setting a precedent. Um, I think that's like the best way to set a tone for a community and continue to improve advertising on Instagram. And how much, how much when, you, when you were doing this checking of all your advertising, which seems insane to me actually, um, I don't read every story anymore. You know what I mean? Like there's a point where you can't do that. What, where does it, does it get to be sort of a programmatic thing where people just have tools where, you, where they just put stuff in? Yeah, I, again, this is like not a huge tax. Like I get to my desk in the morning and there's a booklet and I flip through. Um, and it's a very easy process. And I don't remember the last time I said, no, that advertisement's not So you not actually going. look at print ads. Yeah. Well, it's just easier when I show up to my desk and there's something printed out. There's like a phone you could do that with. Yeah, this is easier. Um, <laughs> uh, and you can take it with you and like go into a meeting and you're not checking your device. So I guess like that's the, most, that's the least interesting part of this. The most interesting part of this is our commitment as co-founders, as a company, to really high quality experiences. One of our values internally is craft, that we actually value craft. There are a lot of companies out there that say, oh, you're spending too much time polishing that thing, oh, you're spending too much time on the pixels, like it doesn't need to look beautiful. We really care about craft. We don't always get it right, but we really care about it. And that's the most important value, I think, internally in the last year is keeping that going as we scale. And it's important that it scales. But I mean, Apple proved that it scales. Well, great. Thank you, too, so much, and thanks for being Thank here. You.